I feel a little bit nervous about this. I've done, I think, one other Facebook Live with my friend Jackie before, but this is my first one doing it by myself. And I invited some of my friends here. You guys probably can't see them. But Cedar and Chachi and Abby and Drew are here for moral support. And once I invited them to gather with me, I realized that um, I've been stepping more and more into, like, challenging myself lately. And some of you maybe saw my post about my, like, anxiety that I have over having my picture taken. <laughs> Specifically, like, profile pictures or, like, posing. Um, I like to make yoga photos, but anything other than that makes me super nervous. And um, I've been feeling really called to share more of my life through photos and videos and just um, gatherings and connecting with community and like-minded people. And so I'm really pushing into my edge of like being more comfortable sharing. And something I realized this week is that I'm actually like more uncomfortable or like embarrassed when my friends are around and like if I was in a room by myself I think I'd feel more comfortable so here I am I'm at my edge and I'm just thrilled to share what I'm about to share with you so this is a cacao ceremony we're here drinking some delicious cacao from Guatemala and the traditional Kind of cheers with the Guatemalans is moving counterclockwise with your cup and saying Maltios, which is a beautiful way of saying thank you. Something I learned about the Mayans actually in a book that I read while I was down in Guatemala is um, that their entire culture is based on like creating a honey or a nectar for the gods and really pleasing the gods and keeping them happy. And that their, their culture believes and, and makes these offerings that what is the honey of the gods and what feeds the gods is beauty and gratitude. And so just pulling it down to something that simple really like touched my heart. And you can tell by, you know, the way that they dress in Guatemala and the way that they treat each other. And there's just like so much beauty and gratitude with the Mayan people. And so that's part of the reason that I want to share this story is I really want to encourage connection um, with our culture and the culture in Guatemala. And <laughs> oh. uh, don't know how that happened. You can move Hello. your channel off and I'll start again. Bye guys. <laughs> Oh, yeah. 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 shot the phone out of the holder. Mm -hmm. it's, mm -hmm. it's okay if it is. Yeah, I think it's cool. I think it's cool because when you think about overcoming your fears, sometimes it's just like having the worst possible thing that could happen actually happen <laughs> and realizing that it's not that bad. So that's something that I learned with downhill mountain biking is like you take that first fall and you're like, oh, okay, I can like really go for it next time. So. I'm just going to go for it after that. <laughs> <laughs> so, Thank you. I, I think I'm just going to start over. I have no idea where I left off, but I have some notes here. And part of the reason that I'm sharing the story is because I'm going back to Guatemala for a retreat coming up on March 27th through April 3rd. And um, I just want to like get this story out there and encourage this like connection um, between our groups of people. And I know some of you are like all over the world and all over the country, but there's a huge network of people in Colorado that are, you know, spiritually enlightened, badass warriors. And that's what I experienced in Guatemala as well. And so I think there's a lot of opportunity for us to um, learn from each other and just like, make these connections. So this is the story of my trip to Guatemala, <laughs> and I've been joking that it's like a story of epic, cosmic, biblical proportions, and that sounds like a tall order to fill, but I promise you, it will be filled. <laughs> so hopefully you can stick with me through this, because the symbolism in the story is like beyond anything that someone could even imagine or write in a book. Like one of my favorite books is The Alchemist. And sometimes I think 
I've like created a life like the main character in the Alchemist and like created that for myself. And this is this is um this is my story. This is what I want to share. So I'll start with a couple years ago I lost my mother and about a week after she passed, maybe two weeks after she passed, I was at a party and this guy came up to me and he said, um, there's a spirit knocking on my head and she won't leave until I talk to you. He said, I don't even channel anymore, but I like have to give you this information. I'm like, okay. And I sit down and he starts speaking to me and he said, oh my goodness, your mother is very masculine and it's not just her. There's an entire tribe of people that are like behind her watching her, talking to you. And he said that she's really sorry because she really did some bad things to you and others in a past life. And she's, she's a man in this tribe. And she said she came to this earth with a very heavy karma and she tried to clear it, but she was unable to. And now she and the tribe were like looking to me to clear this karma. And that's kind of intense. <laughs> Um, but he lightened the mood when he started telling me all about myself. He said, you've been going to the sacred places to collect pieces of yourself. He said, you've been visiting the sacred springs. And this is someone that, like, I didn't even know. Hi, Sean. <laughs> um, at the time, not very well. I'm sure he didn't know what I'd been doing. And he said, you're traveling to these sacred sites. You're traveling to these sacred springs. You're traveling to these sacred waters to like, collect pieces of yourself and to collect memories. And there's more places that you have to go to complete your mission. And so this idea of like completing the mission had been in my head for a while. And, you know, part of the story does involve like medicine ceremony. And um, I've experimented with a few different medicine ceremonies. And <clears throat> every time I got blocked and the message was not until you complete your mission not until you complete your mission, not until you complete your mission. So I was like aware that this was happening and that I was being called to different places. And I've followed the call. I've gone to so many different hot springs and so many different drinking springs. I've been only drinking fresh spring water for the past like four years and harvesting it myself. And so I'm like fulfilling this prophecy, but kind of have no idea where this is going to go. Um, and I didn't even know like my mom actually gifted me these Mayan cards, these tarot cards. I don't know where they went. These really beautiful cards. And actually, before she passed, one of the uh, things that she said to me, she's like, you know, there's only one thing I want to give you before I die, like, while I'm still alive. And she shows me this giant Aztec calendar that's made out of all these tiny little puzzle pieces of wood. And so I think she had left me clues, but I wasn't really, like, aware at the time that she was guiding me toward the, the, the Mayan energy. Um... And then just like one last, uh, I guess, two last little pieces of um, information, like kind of the foreshadowing of the story is that a few years ago on Valentine's Day, my dear friend Abby, who's here, was holding space. We were all holding space for each other. And there was this really interesting spiritual experience where one of my friends, I was laying on the ground, and one of my friends said, there's a light being here asking if you're ready to receive it. And my eyes were closed and I could see this blue winged light being and it kind of like, it's like, are you ready to receive it? I said, yes. It like fell into my body and opened its wings. And when I came, sat up after the experience, the other women that were holding space for me had actually seen this. And they said it had this long androgynous face and it like, it looked like this blue bird. And I had no idea what that was at the time. Um, but one of my friends kind of, mention something he's talking about a bunch of like new age spiritual alien kind of stuff and he said something about the blue avians i said oh, that's what i saw in the vision that's what my friend saw like tell me more and i started researching a little bit about it and connecting with um some other people who have had these like blue avian walk-in experiences amrak who is leading this retreat she's an elder um, my friend Endon, I've heard Jumblo. There's a there's a bunch of us that have had these similar experiences, so it wasn't just me. And so these are just like the points leading up to it, like this prophecy from my mom, this mem this experience of this 
blue bird light being. And then for about the last year in these Mayan cards, I've been pulling the star frog card. And so um, I've read it a million times and a bunch of my girlfriends have been carrying it or pulling it too. And I was reading it and I was getting it and it's super etheric, but I wasn't like really getting it until the closer I got to this trip where I read about this, it says one word in there, bufotini, which is uh, DMT um, that comes from the frog medicine, specifically the Colorado River frog, which like, weirdly enough is in our own backyard. And so this, it was coming to me and I was kind of saying like, eh, I don't know, like that kind of stuff doesn't usually work on me. And then right before I left, one of my dear sisters like had this medicine come to her and she asked me and I was super activated, but I said, you know, no, not right now. Like I know it's coming, but kind of a little bit of like a control freak of like, I don't really know. But what I learned was that there was this bigger path for me. And so for the past four years, I had been saying, I'm going to go to Cosmic Convergence for New Year's. I'm going to go to Cosmic Convergence for New Year's. I'm going to go. I'm going to go. And for four years, it didn't happen. And there was this bigger plan. I wasn't meant to with the medicine before I got there. I wasn't meant to go down there before this specific experience. And so as I was arranging to go to this festival for New Year's, there was another festival that came up on my radar, and that was the Mayan Heart Festival. And immediately, the second I saw it on Facebook, I'm like, I have to go to that. And I write to my friend, Brielle. Hi, Brielle. And um, just like, how do I get involved? And it was like, you know, you're on the right path when things just start happening and happening and happening. And so next thing I know, I'm throwing the pre-party for the festival. And one of my intentions this year was to, like, dance on stage and step into like more uncomfortability with dance and my friend Abby booked us these gigs to dance with two of my favorite acts De Adova and Desert Dwellers and so I'm going to this festival and everything's happening and it's super exciting and like literally my dreams are coming true like my dream of being there my dream of dancing teaching workshops at the festivals so that's kind of like the leading up to it. And then here's where the story kind of begins. So I took a flight down there to meet two of my friends, Lindsay and Abby, a different Abby. So I just to these sisters as well. And we ended up like saving a little bit of money, but in the end, I think it was just because we were like on this path and we ended up deciding to fly into Tulum and then make our way down to Guatemala. So my first day of travel on the plane and the bus and everything else, and we get our rest in, and then the next day we immediately go to the Tulum ruins because we only have one day in Tulum. If you have one day in Tulum, that's what we're going to do. So um, we go there, and these are like deeply spiritual sisters of mine, and so we really approach these places as like we're not touristing. We're going there to hold some and to pray and to meditate and to get downloads and to really hold the sacred space. And so when we arrived, um, we made tobacco offerings at the portal that you walk through and we kind of walked in and started to get a feel for the space. And immediately we decide to go in a certain direction. And the first place we come upon is a cave. And so, you find a cave at the ruins of Tulum, you go in, <laughs> and there's a little bit of water, there's some almost like shelves on, on the side of the cave, and there's a sleeping python. And it's like right away we're dropping in, you know, this is, this is the beginning of a big journey. Um, just the symbolism of like the serpent in the cave is so powerful. And I kind of had this vision of, someone lying down and that this was a preparation place and like a medicine place, like a, a healing place, but I wasn't really sure what I was seeing. And I, and I get visions like this when I go to, to pretty much anywhere these days. Um, so then we go up the path and around to the top of the hill. So the cave is down here and then the, some of the ruins are up here and we're kind of absorbing and looking and deciding where we want to go. And there's a tour guide that says, you know, this is the highest point. We think it was a lookout point. And there's a little, like, four foot by four foot stone platform. 
And it's the only part of Tulum that is not blocked off by ropes. It's the only part. It's this platform. Two steps up and then just like a big square. And so I think, well, that must be the lookout. The highest point, I'm going to go two steps up and get a better view or whatever. So I walk up and I stand on there and immediately I'm overcome with like a sensation or a vision of being nude, of being stripped naked, of being on display. The words that came to my mind were kind of like an auction block. And so I'm a little bit shaken and Lindsay's looking at me like, what are you doing just climbing up there? This is sacred space. And I climb down and we kind of talk about it and I'm like, this place is not what they say it is. And I'm having really intense visions. And can we please meditate together and see what comes through? And so we, again, make tobacco offerings, like very sacred, really honoring. And we go back up onto the platform and the three of us sit in meditation for minutes, moments, I don't know how long. And while this is happening, there's a different tour guide that's talking about how they think it was a well where they were getting water, but there's actually the remains of seven women in the bottom of this well. And so right away, I know that like my vision and my sensation was probably something that happened to one of these women before they were sacrificed in this well. And so in the state of meditation, in the state of receptivity, I'm seeing that these women willingly walked into the well. And if you know anything about the Mayans, you know that they love to sacrifice themselves. <laughs> it's like a huge part of their culture. Um, and at the time, I didn't know that. Like, I've learned so much more since then. But I'm like, oh, my gosh, these women, like, walked right into the well. <laughs> and so I start thinking, like, what is it that I'm willing to sacrifice? What would I be willing to walk into a well for? And so I'm meditating on what would I be willing to walk into a well. And right away, the answer comes you're masculine. And I've been holding a lot of masculine space. I've been with structure and finances and getting stuff done, just this, like powerful, penetrating energy. And I'm like really stepping into my femininity and wanting to be more receptive and wanting to hold more of that space. So I said, okay, in my state of meditation with my eyes closed, I just visualized this like masculine part of myself just marching right into the well and just <sighs> sacrificing to the well. And in that moment, I felt energy come up and just, like, literally, my womb felt like it popped and was full. And I was kind of like, said this prayer, to the wind, please take it away. It's not mine. Like, release what's not mine. And I was like, started praying to, like, release all the souls that were trapped in this place. And I got this whisper in my ear from spirit that said, the rising of the divine feminine is not in anyone that's alive. It's in freeing that which has been trapped in the earth. And that was like a very clear message. And so we finish our meditation, we talk about it, we have like a really interesting uh, spiritual experience with a, um, a lizard, what do they call it, iguana. <laughs> We're having this amazing time and kind of just like brush it aside, let it go doesn't surprise me with these sisters, stuff like this is going to happen. Usually it's kind of like one-off stuff. And I'm like, okay, mission accomplished, whatever. And we go on about our day, finish Tulum, have a lovely time. And then the next day we're en route to Guatemala and we end up kind of stranded in Belize for the night. And so um, we're in San Ignacio, which ends up being a lovely town. <clears throat> We find this amazing little hostel that's walking distance to another ruin. So we're not on our agenda of places to go. But of course, we can walk to the ruins. That's where we're going to go. And we walk up the hill to what they're calling a temple. They say these are the temple grounds. And But as soon as you can walk in, it doesn't feel like a temple at all. It's an outdoor space. There's many different, like, sections of the structures and there's one thing in the information of the place that they say they say we don't know, we don't know why the steps are so tall the steps to the temple and they say um, maybe it's because they're supposed to crawl on their hands and knees or maybe it's for the gods that they worshiped that were so much bigger than them um, but as soon as you walk in you're like well, duh. those are not steps they're bleachers 
hips. And they're actually the perfect size to sit on. And they're these squares with these bleachers. And there's one area that actually has two little rooms that go out to the same big doorway on these massive stairs where on the other side is a giant pyramid. And it's like, I go in there and right away I feel like warrior getting ready for battle. Either two teams or two people, like they're gonna come out and present themselves and go into the field. And again, what, you, what I learned later is that the Mayans were very well known for their ball games, their blood sacrifice. The Mayans are all about sacrificing the winners um, of these games. So I thought it was interesting that they like called it a temple and, and I might have that incorrect, but I'm pretty sure that's, that's what happened. So we're in this, this space and we're kind of whispering to each other like, there's a lot of sacrifice here too. Like let's pray to release these souls. And so I climb up to the top of the pyramid, the very, very top, and I'm sitting and I have this blue scarf over my head and I'm meditating and this girl comes up and is taking selfies. <laughs> and I said, you do me the right way? She said, no, you look like one of the goddesses. And I was like, I am. <laughs> and when I kind of leaned over to look at her, I was on top of one of the platforms on this pyramid. And you can see that it's been filled in with concrete got me curious so I like walked around down to the bottom and there's the platform and then there's a stone pipe that comes out from where the concrete was filled up and you can just it's very very obvious that they were sacrificing people and that the blood was coming down this stone pipe and I could literally see the blood all the way down the temple steps. So we're on this journey and discovering these interesting downloads and, and really tapping into this idea of like sacrifice and what that meant to the Mayans. And so after Belize, we get on a bus and we go to the Mayan Heart Festival. And it's on this beautiful lake in the north of Guatemala. And the whole festival is meant to go to Tikal, these giant, beautiful pyramids, the Mayan pyramids. Um, and that's happening like the, the next day, like day two in the festival. And um, when everybody was going to go, originally, like this place is known for the sunrise on the winter solstice, and I believe on the summer solstice as well. And everything's aligned, you know how like the ancient pyramids are like the sun aligns in this perfect way. And but the rest of the festival decided they were gonna go at 10 30 in the morning because of the timing, because not everyone was there yet. You have to get your tickets the day before, and so they were just gonna like get everyone to go like once it opened. But my friends, um, we decided to book a private shuttle and go for the sunrise. And so it was like my first day there, and I had dress rehearsal with Dea and Shani. And um, I mean, we were up until like one or two in the morning, like practicing how to put on all these intricate headdresses and outfits and costumes and jewelry. And she makes all her own costumes and jewelry. It was like so epic and so fun. My dreams are coming through and I'm so excited. And I get home and I have one hour to sleep before I have to like get on a bus to go watch the sunrise. <laughs> so uh, I did it. Like it, when things are that important to you, when you're like on your spiritual path, like there's nothing that's going to get in your way. So I ended up um, getting on the bus on very little sleep. And my friends, Lindsay and Abby actually got asked, they weren't allowed in because somehow they got like the wrong kind of ticket. They didn't have both kinds. And I'm with my friend Endon and we go in, it's before light and the forest is just like totally dark and we're being guided in and the guide, we're kind of losing the guide. And so we're in the jungle by ourselves and really feeling this vibe. And we, we walk up to the top of the pyramid to watch the sunrise. And there's so much beautiful fog. We're not sure we're going to see anything. And the fog just begins lifting and lifting and lifting. And it's getting closer to this time when the sun is going to rise. And there's people up there. There's like a little bit of a crowd. And <clears throat> when the sun rises on the winter solstice, it is directly over the pyramid. It is like a lighthouse lighting up. And I'll post some pictures tomorrow of this whole experience so that you guys can have more of a visual of what I'm talking about. But 
it was one of the most profound experiences I've ever had in my whole life. And I couldn't really tell you why. I was just like getting so much from this experience. And just the alignment and the light and the forest and the monkeys and the birds and there's people. And I'm just taking it all in and just completely mesmerized. And in my mesmerization, <laughs> everyone kind of funneled out. And so it ended up just being um, and Don and a few of our friends. I think there was four men that were there. And I look and I realize that the sun, while it's rising, is is not really pointing at me. And I'm kind of dead center. It's like a little bit over. And so I look over and I look up. And it's the, what they call, I think, the king's chamber. And it's this chamber at the top of the pyramids that's um, gated off. I'm like, we got to go up there and check that out. And I'm making my head in and I say, wow, what is it? Is it and I was like, is it a, a stargate? And I'm like, probably it's like a landing pad. And then our echo is happening. And I say, this is a sound chamber. And he said, let's turn it on. <laughs> And he gets his flute and he's playing into the pyramid and the sound is echoing over the past us over the entire jungle of Tikal and the birds and the monkeys are going crazy and the birds actually come and sit on the steps and they're all around us and he's playing his flute and it's like the most beautiful thing I've ever experienced and the other guys come over and they start toning and they're all toning these like deep guttural sounds and then and then start singing this like operatic light language I don't even know and I was dancing and we literally had an audience of birds all around us and it was one of the most like surreal spiritual experiences of my entire life but even then I didn't know like what it meant I just knew that it happened and that it was happening so after sunrise we go down and we meet with the rest of the festival that's in between the Pyramid of the Jaguar and the Pyramid of the Moon. And there's a giant fire pit and the Mayans and the elders are there holding space. And it's mostly festival goers that are around. I mean, there's a quite a bit of, you know, the the Mayan people, but I feel like it was, am I right, Abby? It was mostly tourists and festival people. Tourists yeah. and festival people. And so we go through this beautiful Mayan fire ceremony where we're honoring the 20 walls and the energies that the Mayans are making offerings to and everyone's making offerings. But the vibe is like super heavy and super intense to where I was like feeling exhausted. I mean, granted, I only got an hour of sleep before. Um, and, you know, the whole point or the whole... I guess message for the Mayan Heart Festival was Amaya, who put it together, said it was the declaration for the liberation of the earth. And so that was one of the reasons that I felt called to be there, because it was on the winter solstice and the day of the full moon, and we were in this sacred place and we were offering this declaration for the liberation of the earth. So after the fire ceremony happens, Amaya gets out and he's reading this, you know, many paged document that I think he had written that he was speaking into the cosmos, the declaration for the liberation of the earth and end to corrupt governments now. And he said, you know, to the corrupt banking system now, he was just really speaking this into existence. And I literally did not find this out till like mid January that we're talking winter solstice, December 21st, 22nd. And like, I didn't know till mid January that the government had actually shut down on that day. And so, you know, the work that he was doing and like what, what he was declaring was super powerful. So we have the whole fire ceremony, the declaration for the liberation of the earth. I go back to the festival to, um, to get ready for the biggest night of my life, like the biggest performance that I've ever had the privilege of being a part of. And luckily the energy of the day at this time um, actually, I take that back. <laughs> the energy came later. What happened first was that when I got back to the festival, I saw this elder who had given a big speech at the, at the fire ceremony. And he said that this was the end of a cycle and it was the beginning of a new cycle where it was balanced masculine and feminine. And he said balanced light and dark. 
and he said that um, the we always have a balance of light and dark, but that the light was hidden, and that's why the dark had reigned, and that this was a new time of a balance of light and dark and a balance of masculine and feminine. And he was speaking this at the fire ceremony, and I was like crying, like sobbing, crying. It was kind of weird, um, but I just went with it. And then when I got back to the festival grounds, I saw him and I went up to him, Carlos, to to say thank you. And I and I started crying again. And I was just sobbing and sobbing. And I went back to Abby and Lindsay and I started crying. And they said, "What's wrong?" And I, without thinking about what I was saying, I I said, "You know, we did this to them." And. I started explaining to them that I had this understanding that, you know, the Mayans have, they have worshipped this blue bird being, Quetzalcoatl, and there's these stories of him leaving and coming back, and there's these different messages, and, like, one of the messages was the story of him, like, saying no more human sacrifice, right? And so I know that that was, like, important to him. But what I started to feel was that the, these blue bird beings had come down to like the, the people of the earth, the, the first peoples, and given them like helpful information, right? And, and offered to them that, you know, give your love to the earth, give your beauty to the earth, give your best and your brightest and your strongest and give your blood and give your blessings to the earth and the earth will respond. And that sounds like a beautiful message, but it almost felt like it had gotten a little bit twisted because the Mayans truly were sacrificing the winners of, in their sports, they were sacrificing their like most beautiful virgins they were sacrificing like their smartest and their brightest and what i realized was that when these beings were sacrificed especially if they were sacrificed like into a well or like down these steps into the earth that that that's what created the imbalance of light and dark is that we sacrificed our best and our brightest and our purest and so there starts to be little whispers that are happen happening around the festival where people are saying, like, do you know what we just did? Like, the elders know, but do you know? And someone, I don't remember who said this, so I don't know if it's correct, but someone said, like, we just freed 36,000 souls. And I felt like I was really grieving for the fact that we even had to, whoever we is, you know? But, you know, Deodova sings a song of the return of the bird tribe. When you look around the festival, it's, like, very obvious that, like, this is the prophecy. And um, definitely the first time in my life that I felt like a part of a prophecy. Um, but I was feeling it. And so I'm trying to make sense of it all. I'm trying to get ready. Abby and I have, like, so much makeup to put on these big... Deodoba says, do star, galactic star child eyes. And we paint our eyes blue and we go and we put on the blue cape and these big blue feathered headdress and these blue feathered arm cuffs. And we're holding these silver mirrored snakes. And all of a sudden I realize it's the serpent egg. It's the serpent coming out of the cave and it's the feathered serpent and it's the return of the bird tribes. And like, Dancing as a blue bird in the return of the bird tribes is powerful anywhere in the world. But doing it on the winter solstice in Guatemala under the full moon with the Mayan elders that say that we're a part of the prophecy was like, holy shit, you guys, <laughs> this is so much more. Like, Maltios! Maltios! <laughs> I don't know. If the Mayans originally danced in Tikal, but we were enacting something so much bigger than ourselves. And the songs that we danced to were Return of the Bird Tribes, Resonant Migration, with like big blue feathered bird feather fingers, and then we danced to um, The Serpent's Egg which was like the first song we did when I really started to feel like, holy shit, what are we doing? This is so intense. And then when the Return of the Bird Tribes came out, 
literally did double had me dressed with these silver wings on my forehead, big blue feathered head, headdress behind me, a metal bird mask with chains hanging on it, and mirrored laser cut bird wing shield. And I'm like in full warrior mode, just like under the full moon, dancing, like enacting something so powerful, this return of the bird tribes. It's no longer about like when it's happening or how long it's happening. It's like happened. It's happening. It's, it happened. So under the full moon with my sisters in this ceremony, I actually start my moon time. I start bleeding and I'm this is really potent, magical blood. Like, I want to save this, and I want to offer it to the earth as, like, retribution for all of the, like, living light blood that had been offered. And so I saved my blood for a couple of days. And meanwhile, my sisters and I are noticing that this festival is a ceremonial space. It's not a festival. It's a gathering of tribe. There, it's, it's pretty small, a couple hundred people, I feel like. And there's a lot of medicine activations that are happening. And this is where I get a little bit nervous talking about this, but I just want to be open with people, you know? It's like, I just want to be open about what's happening. This is really powerful magic. So there are um, a bunch of people that are having medicine ceremony with this, with the bufotine, with the toad medicine, with the 5-MeO-DMT. And um, it all of a sudden becomes apparent that like, I'm so, this is the space that I'm supposed to do this in. And so, um, so sisters and I are talking and it's like, there's one gentleman who we love so, love so. you. Um, who offers us, but it's like instantly, like, you know, when you say something like almost before you realize you said it, Abby's like, we need to do it with a woman. And I'm like, okay, yeah, let's do it. <laughs> and he's like, that one, she says, that one over there. And we walk over and it's, she, she, love you, love you, she, she. oh my gosh. And she just says, yes. She said, tomorrow is the first day of a new Mayan cycle. It's the day of the Jaguar. It's a feminine day. And I can take you to the women's land this ancient woman's land and she said let's do it tomorrow so we decide to go in the morning we wake up it's raining like pretty hard we're like how are we gonna go to this like women's land in the forest but we're all pretty dedicated to going there and so we go to the women's land it's this beautiful forested land it's an unexcavated archaeological site um, that from what we understand was the, the women's land there's like a pyramid that hasn't been excavated so it's just um, covered in, it looks like a hill, and there's a beautiful giant stone that's carved, and we arrive, and it's four sisters, two shamanesses, and one masculine holding space for us, Louise, we love you, and we get there, and there's a giant stone carving, and it's of four people holding medicine ceremony, and it's like this ancient star stone carving of four people holding medicine ceremony, so we're like starting to drop in, and starting to set up, and Shuni makes a beautiful fire, and she had guided us through a cacao ceremony the night before, so we knew about, you know, Maltiosh, and we knew about making offerings to the different 20 energies, the 20 walls, and she's preparing for that, and they lay out a giant tar that has a seven-pointed star in it, and then some bamboo mats around it for when we're going to have the ceremony, and I'm like, Shuni, we have offerings, and she was like, I brought like an apple, everybody brought different things. And I said, I have my moon blood from the full moon. And she was like, this is not a coincidence. You need to go up there right now and make your offering. And so I go up to the top of the hill and I find what appears to be overgrown temple steps. And I make like a blood offering to the temple steps. And I'm starting to understand that, uh, again, like what we're doing is bigger than what we're doing. And it's starting to feel like beyond you know, myself, and I'm like, what is happening? So we go back down, and we have the most beautiful fire ceremony where we offer cacao seeds to every one of the energies, every one of the Noels. Maltiosh. And, um, and we go through the whole ceremony. It takes quite a bit of time, and it's already starting to feel like the witchiest thing that has ever happened to me. Like, we're in the woods, and we're cutting 
words, and we're like making these offerings, and we're speaking these names. And after we have the ceremony, then we go to the space that they had set up for us with a seven-pointed star. And my one sister who offered herself up to go first, and, um, you know, I'm so grateful that you did that, sister, because I think all of us were a little bit nervous. And what happened next was like one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen. <laughs> and we're all holding space around her and she's with the medicine. And this is medicine that doesn't last very long, which is why we were able to kind of go through this process. And right away, she's like on her knees and she just starts moving in the most beautiful, elegant, fluid way. And she's just dancing and her eyes are closed. And honestly, I've never seen her move like this. It's so amazing. And she starts speaking in tongues and she's moving. And like, if you've ever witnessed someone in a trance state speaking in tongues, like this is a very real thing that happens and it is so powerful. We're all watching her. It's this beautiful experience. And you can tell that she's like praying for something. And she actually gets up and does a little bit of yoga with her eyes closed. And you can tell she's having like a great experience. And I almost had this feeling of like, she's at home and she's very at home. Um, and then she goes over to the fire and she just starts crying and she's like sobbing and weeping and sobbing and weeping and she's releasing so much. And she'll tell you later that she was like crying for a prayer that she had held for the earth for like millions of years and that she was home on like this other planet space where this like type of medicine is or, or at least this type of experience is more common. And, um, and then everybody kind of looks at me and they're like, you're next. And I'm like, okay, I was really nervous. And, but I felt like everyone said it at the same time. So that's how it was supposed to go. And I go and I'm with medicine and nothing happens. Like literally nothing happens, which is exactly what used to happen Every time I tried to be with medicine and I got the message, not till you complete your mission. And so they're kind of looking at me like, well, that's weird. This is really powerful stuff and nothing is happening. And I, and I say, I say, I think it's because Abby has to be here. This is a different Abby. There's a couple Abbeys. When I, when the movie comes out, <laughs> um, <laughs> so she comes back, they clear some space and then I'm with the medicine again. And everything else I'm about to tell you is just what I've gathered from my friends telling me um, because I immediately like disintegrated. Like there's this like new understanding of like flow and dance from like the type of disintegration that happened in my body. Like I completely dissolved and completely left my body. And what I was told happened, and you can interrupt if you need me to correct me, but is that I was... Um, kind of like pounding on my womb. I was like pounding on my, um, my whole reproductive area. Um, from what I understand, I was even like reaching inside of my body and like kind of touching myself. And there was like a lot of energy channeled around my womb area. And, you know, my interpretation of what happened next is that I released whatever I had released into loom into my womb was like released into my body because what I was told is that I was like jumping up and falling down and rolling around and like my hair was up it was twisted in like a French twist and when I came out it was like wild and filled with sticks and dirt and like one of my friends said that my eyes were wide open and they were a completely different color and like apparently it took like four people to hold me down and I don't even know but when I came to, they called me back. Apparently, Luis did some rattling, he said, over my solar plexus. But I know now it was like the womb release that happened because the being left my body. Lindsay called me back into my feet. And then they put some drops in my mouth and I came to. And I came to like, <gasps> and I look up and like, one of them's like this. And like, Abby's like crying and everyone's just like, kind of like, what the fuck? 
fuck just happened? And immediately I have, even though I like don't necessarily remember what happened, I have this like immediate knowing like that was like a, a resurrection. That was like a rebirth of divine feminine. That's like, it was like the feminine resurrection was like immediately what I felt like it was. And I open my eyes and I look at my friends and the first, the only thing I say, the first thing I say is, holy shit, you guys, what did we just do? And I have this knowing that like the symbol was a big part of it and the place was a big part of it and the date was a big part of it. And I've been holding these new moon and these full moon ceremonies for like six years. And I'm like seeing every full moon, every new moon, every full moon, every new moon. I was like checking them off until like the right one. And I'm just like fully aware that something way bigger than myself just happened that we all just released something really intense and really important and they're like go to the fire so I go to the fire and all I can hear in my ear is you know exactly what to do 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 and I'm like looking around the fire and immediately I had to clear away anything plastic or synthetic there were like some chairs and some like twist ties and I like cleared them out and then I built a mandala and I'm still in this like the, 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 the like medicine state and like everything's just super intense. And I make this mandala out of the candles around the fire. And I had a necklace that was a Dia de los Muertos necklace that I had from Dia de los Muertos that actually opened and had a little baggie of my mom's ashes in it. And I actually hadn't really thought about the fact that I like brought her there until that moment where it's, you know exactly what to do, you know exactly what to do, you know exactly what to do. And so I took her ashes out and I poured them in a coconut and I put the like few cacao seeds that were left and I hid the little baggie out of the way and I'm like swirling it and it's like, you know exactly what to do, you know exactly what to do, you know exactly what to do. And I offered my mom's ashes with these cacao seeds to the fire and I felt like oh, it's done mission complete like I felt that so strongly and I was able to like go back to the circle and hold space for the other two sisters one of which said she went down into the earth and she like grounded it down and she brought this whole experience like into the earthly realm. And then my other friend actually embodied this beautiful snake energy and she's like moving like a snake and just and it was like so beautiful and so powerful. And one of the sisters actually said that she saw a giant white snake, like a white snake being that was who showed up in that moment. And if you know anything about this medicine, it's like a surrender to everything. It's a surrender to um, the unknown, it's a surrender to the cosmos. And after our experience, I truly believe that like, if you are physically, mentally, and emotionally prepared for that surrender, that there's like deep karmic healing of the whole planet that can happen through your body. And, um, you know, one of the ways that I knew that is after the ceremony, I started researching, like, what happened in Tikal, like, the 36,000 souls, like, how did, um, what was the fall, and, and what I read about was that it was the snake dynasty that had come in to the, the Mayans of Tikal that were dressed in blue bird costumes, and the snake dynasty actually came in and, like, befriended them, and that they, um, somehow got them to sacrifice themselves, got them to sacrifice their kings and their queens. And once there was no leadership, then the society dissolved. And I truly felt that, you know, Abby and I embodying these energies that we like were literally releasing this like feud that had happened with these tribes of people and like all the sacrifice and everything else and I'm skipping a little bit ahead in the story, but I'll tell you that Amrak, who's leading this retreat that I'm going on, she's like this amazing Mayan elder who um, was, is, was born and raised in Tikal. Her, her dad was an archaeologist there. So she lived there when it was still dirt on a pyramid before they like removed the dirt and uncovered the pyramid. She did yoga on the tops of the of the pyramids she has a past life memory of being like a priestess there and preaching no more sacrifice 
And so further along in my story, when I met with her, she told me, she said, do you know how they got their leaders to kill themselves, to sacrifice themselves? And I said, how? And she said, it was lethal. And I'm like, what? Because what I know about this medicine is that it's super poisonous if you ingest it. Um, and people just started smoking it 50 years ago. It's like the newest, like, animal plant medicine, animal medicine on earth because people just started smoking it. So knowing that you can't ingest it, knowing that people didn't smoke it, but people always knew it was special because they were always trying to ingest it. They were always trying to find new ways. And so I'm like, how did they do that? And she said, they did it through enemas. And if you look at Mayan art, all over Mayan art are enemas. And they talk about how the Mayans used alcohol enemas for spiritual experience. And they found all these bufo toad skins that had been soaked in alcohol. So they know that they're putting the bufo toad skins in the alcohol. But somehow in all my research, no one really talked about like the alcohol is infused with the medicine, the alcohol is being used, you know, rectally. And so they were actually like using this medicine like quite a lot from what I understand. And like, I'll have to do more research into that. But it is interesting that this medicine has like come through for the healing with like the blue bird tribes and the people of Tikal with the, um, the snake dynasty. And just like, I feel like I'm like on the spiritual quest, like uncovering little cute clues as we go along. And so that was on, the medicine ceremony was on Christmas Eve. And the very next day we get up and we're on a bus tour from festival number one to festival number two, from Mayan Heart Festival to Cosmic Convergence. But by way of a bunch of sacred sites and it's like, it's a tour with, it's jam packed with things for us to do. And I'm researching, this is when I really researched about the Snake Dynasty and I'm starting to think like, what is happening? This is so intense. And they take us to these, these other ruins on the way to Honduras. And we have barely any time there, but I'm running around and I'm like, none of these places are what people say they are. Like, what kinds of downloads do I get from this place? And there's literally a giant carving of a frog the size of a Volkswagen with the enlarged glands behind it. I mean, this is like the medicine of these people. And so that was one of the clues. And I feel like I probably got a lot more information from that place, but it was a very fast tour. And then we're on our way to the Lunar Jaguar Hot Springs, which is where one of these sisters, Lindsay, had gotten like a major download of the geometry of the 12 pointed star like years ago. And I've been determined to go there because I'm obsessed with hot springs. I'm on the spiritual mission. That's why I joined the tour because we were going to the hot springs and we're on our way there. And the day has been quite long, lots of bus riding. And five minutes before the border in Honduras closed, so five minutes till midnight, uh, we were five minutes from the border. We actually could pretty much see the border from where we were. All of a sudden the radiator on our bus explodes and we all get off the bus and it turns into this moment of like choice because there's some locals with trucks that are ready to drive us over the border and with all of our stuff. And I actually got on a truck with all my stuff and I was ready to go. And I heard spirit whisper in my ear, don't fucking do it. And I got off the bus and I kind of yelled at everybody and I said, what are we doing? Spirit is trying to stop us. Like we're literally running so late and then the bus just broke down. And what's going to happen if we go into Honduras? We're going to be sitting there. The guards aren't going to be able to go home because they're going to be waiting with us for a bus. Like, I don't know if I was a guard, a bunch of people kept me from going home. I might be like checking out people's stuff, finding out what's in there. I don't know. I had a super bad feeling about it. And I just said, I don't think we should do it. And not everyone agreed with me, but it was like, I've literally never felt so strongly in my life. Well, I'm sure I have, but it was powerful. <laughs> and so um, there's a secondary bus that's coming to pick us up on the Guatemala side, which that felt better to me because the bus company was from Guatemala. They were sending a secondary bus. So we could like figure it out, but we weren't on the other side with no bus and like, how do we go? And so there's like police lights shining in my eyes because they're trying to help us. There's a lot of chaos. There's bags. There's things going on. And I really have to pee. And I'm like, 
there's so many lights that I don't really know like where to properly pop a squat. And so I see like a shady area and shadow in the lights and I'm like, I'm gonna go pee there. And I, um, I start walking out the street and, um, and um, I'm about to step off the road and go into the shady spot. And I'm like kind of just ready to go. And I take like two steps and I just, boom, I fall into a nine foot well, like no joke. And there's a concrete ledge halfway down actually hit my back really hard and had like a huge contusion and huge bruise on my hip and then went down and I'm like, I actually screamed like in a movie and I felt my hair go up. I don't know how that happens. Like you have to fall pretty far to have a sensation of like, <sighs> and so someone comes to rescue me. Thank God I screamed because I like definitely had the wind knocked out of me and he's like, okay I'm like get me out of this hole and they pull me out of the well and something that I learned later in my journey is that um, in order to manifest first you dream it then you hold ceremony for it and then it happens in real life so I meditated on walking into a well in Tulum I held ceremony on being resurrected from the dead and then I actually fell into a well and was fished out in real life. <laughs> and it was one of those moments where I'm like, you gotta be fucking kidding me. Um, but I was actually pretty injured and I like went into shock and never had an experience where like my ears rang so loudly. Um, but luckily, um, Hata was there and she had an amazing herbal tincture that she put in my mouth that like brought me back from, like it was really weird. It's the first time in my life where I actually felt like I could just die. And I think it's because I had been with the medicine the day before that had the minds feel like they could just die. You know, I, I like actually almost had like a flashback where I was just like, I was ready to go. It's like mission accomplished. I'm ready to go. So when Anna had to give me the drops and call me back, it's like, that was a really pivotal point. I feel like, um, so the story continues and, I'm injured. We end up at a different hot springs and have a couple of days of travel on our way to cosmic convergence. And I'm, I'm just really nursing it and taking care of myself. And luckily I was okay. My boyfriend's an amazing body worker. And he said, of all the places in your body you could hit, that was like the meatiest, hardiest part to hit. So it took me a little bit of time, but I ended up, um, being okay. And I'm going to look at my notes really quick. So then we're, we're heading to Cosmic Convergence. And when we first arrive at Lake Atitlan for the second festival, um, we take a little boat tour around. And I'm like still hurt. I'm still struggling. I'm like kind of limping and gimping around. And a part of the bus tour we stop in San Marcos. And right away, the first things that come out of my mouth is I say, I need a curandera. And that's like a medicine woman. And in my mind, I'm like, I need a, a, a woman. I need like an elder. I need someone to hold space for me. Like I literally hadn't even cried about my injuries. Like I was just holding it together until I got there. So immediately upon landing, someone says to me, Amrak's doing a water ceremony. Do you want to go? And I've actually never met Amrak before, but I've seen her do opening ceremony at Rise. And one of my best friends, Alexis, hi Alexis, she actually has been going to ceremonies with Amrak since she was four, because she's from Honduras. So it's like my best friend from Denver is like Honduras spiritual leader, happens to be in San Marcos. Right when I say I need a put in there, I'm like, yes, I'm gonna go. So she sets us up in this beautiful park on the rocks overlooking the water with some water that she's had some beautiful sacred sources and like this amazing Atlantean crystal and she asks each of us to offer our prayers to the water. Some people go down and they like have their hand around it and they're praying and she says no you have to say it out loud. So people are actually speaking their vibrational plant prayers into the water and everyone kind of had something different to say and then when it was my turn to speak like something came over me. I was crying again, I was sobbing 
And I was literally begging for forgiveness from the water. And I was just like, I'm, because I've been drinking spring water for the past four years, and really my whole life, my parents always took me to the spring in the Shenandoah Mountains. And because I'm aware that there are fresh water springs that anyone can drink from that have been flowing for hundreds of thousands of years. You don't have to turn the tap off when you brush your teeth. You don't have to worry about it. They are the ever flowing well springs that exist on our planet. And it's not like you can use too much of them because they continue to flow. Protecting them, yes. You know, there's a lot of things about springs and their temperature and the shade and the energy about it. But like in all reality, they're ever flowing. And so what happened with the Mayans? You know, I've talked a little bit about um, some of the sacrifice that happened and some of the like, you know, the takeover. But there's also, you know, there's evidence that there was a grand drought. And, you know, that was a big part of it as well. And so during these times of drought, they're trying to please the gods. They're trying to make offerings. They're offering up their beautiful women. When in fact, with the knowledge of the wellsprings, with the knowledge of the ever-flowing wellspring, it's, it's likely that survival would be a greater chance. I mean, I can't put my piece on what exactly would happen, but it felt important to like apologize to water. I was like, I'm so sorry that we have sacrificed to you. And I'm crying and I'm like, I'm so sorry that, that this thing that is ever flowing from the earth is something that was one of the first things that we had a scarcity mindset about. Like as humans, we're like, experience like scarcity in love and scarcity in money and scarcity in food when like our earth is abundant but I felt like water was one of the first scarcities so I had a beautiful experience of like atonement to the waters and we were able to like throw the water in the lake and go swimming in the lake and I just felt so refreshed and renewed and like I told my friends I'm like this whole trip has been about the water because an interesting fact is the first lake that we were on, Paten, and then the second lake that we were on, Atitlan, they're actually connected. When one rises, the other falls. And they put, put uh, like an antibacterial in one of them and actually killed off some of the animals in the other one. And then we have this connection to these like inner waterways, and it's like this whole trip is about the water. And so that felt like a nice like culmination to this um, this epic journey that had been on and then we go to cosmic convergence and abby and i actually had to work through some like frenemy kind of stuff honestly we like talked about some really hard stuff and i felt like we were even further healing into these these energies of like the bird and the snake that we had embodied it was like we we continued to do the work in our now time and in our now timeline. And it was so healing and it was so powerful. And we were blessed to be able to dance with desert dwellers at midnight on New Year's. And it's like, oh my God, this is our lives. It's so amazing. And there was this moment where I was up on stage and there's two platforms and I was on one side and Abby was on the other side and we were dancing. And I looked over and I realized that she had these beautiful bird feathers in her head. And I was wearing this like gold onesie with a hood that was snake skin. And I was like, holy shit, now she's the bird and I'm the snake. <laughs> and it was like this powerful moment, especially because like afterwards, a couple of people came up and were like, you two were amazing. That was such a good matchup. They like really felt the vibes. So cosmic convergence came and went. It was powerful. It's one of my favorite festivals, by the way. So next year, I'm encouraging friends to come with to Cosmic Convergence. And then we're going to have a little post-convergence ecstatic dance retreat afterwards. But that's a separate story. But love Cosmic, Cosmic Convergence. Can't wait to go back. And then I ended up going back to San Marcos, where I had seen Amra. And I had this beautiful experience of staying in a pyramid, at the top of this peninsula in the nature preserve where we had done the um, 
the water ceremony, and forgive me, I'm going to look at my notes for this part, because um, there's just a few key points. I'm not going to tell, like, my whole story of San Marcos, and I got to study the Mayan calendar, and I got to see the sunrise every day, and I went to this amazing full moon party that's, like, one of the most epic monthly parties in the world and it inspired me more for the full moon parties that I'm doing in Denver but like I'm not going to get too much into that but I did want to touch on a few key points because it kind of rounds out this experience the same way I gave you like the little preface and then the story and then this is a little like post uh, post story <laughs> PS <laughs> so when there's seven of us staying in this house this pyramid house at the top where literally we could see the sunrise over the lake and then we could see the sunset over the lake because it was on the peninsula. And like, how many places in the world actually have that? It was, and the volcano was poofing off smoke and it was just like so profound. But there ended up being seven of us there. And at one point I'm looking through a book and there's two stories about the books there. One is when I first got to this house, there's a book called Jaguar Wisdom. And I whispered into it, tell me what I need to know. And I opened it up, and it's a two-page spread that says the pool of souls. And I'll, I can post this with my pictures because I took a picture of it. And it literally says that when the Mayans sacrificed themselves, their soul went to underground wells where they waited to be released into a woman's womb. And, like, just opening that page and reading that, like, helped me feel like I'm not making this shit up. Like, <laughs> <laughs> and I show my friend, I'm like, holy shit. They're like, oh my God. And so that was like the first um, book in the book story. And then the other part was there's, there's seven of us and I'm reading about this prophecy of the Mayans coming back in, in different forms. And about the new earth being like these solar powered peoples that are working in the realms of synesthesia and working with the senses and working with temples of taste and temples of tea and temples of sound and traveling tr art, traveling troops of dance. And it talks about art cells of beings that would come together and then spread these new vibrations. And I'm like very clearly seeing that festival culture is prophecy prophesize <laughs> um, in these Mayan prophecies. And then at one point I flip open and I see like the seal of the guardians and it's the exact seven pointed star that we had done medicine ceremony on. And I'm like, okay. And there's seven of us staying in the house. So we start calling ourselves like the guardians and that we're the ancestors and we're here to like create the new timeline and create the new earth. And we did, we had a new moon ceremony while we were there where we sat literally from like 9 PM till 9 AM, like probably 12 or 13 of us. And we each made offering after offering, after offering candle, after candle, after candle, copal after copal, after copal to tobacco after tobacco after tobacco. And every single thing was a prayer for the future. And it was a prayer for, of gratitude and it was a prayer for the waters and it was a prayer for the earth and it was a prayer for like the new paradigm and the new way. And it was like this deep knowing of like, we are the ancestors of the future generations. So if our Mayan ancestors, if our indigenous ancestors were like telling these stories and creating reality, then like we also have to participate in the cycle into the future. And at one point we also did like a, inception meditation where we created an organite pyramid surrounded by seven organite circles and all seven of us went to bed and we decided to dream that we were meditating and that in the meditation we like went to the pyramids at the bottom of the lake in Atitlan which that's a whole nother thing you can look it up online and so we were doing this like group dream work that was super cool and when so these are like the little pieces and then i'll kind of jump ahead to um a couple weeks later i was out to dinner with this um, amazing woman safira i love you Safira, and we didn't really know each other at all 
but she had just done like a different medicine ceremony and I was like asking her how it was and I'm like you know tell me about it and she's everyone said that her eyes were rolled back in her head and she was really in this altered state but she was doing a bunch of automatic writing and I said I want to see your automatic writing and it was like crazy writing and there's one part that caught my eye and it said where do I find the others the intergalactic guardians the the auronauts which are people who dream awake people who go on missions in their dreams and she says start with Eris he knows and she did this in an altered state and I'm looking at her and I'm like you have no fucking clue there's seven of us that are calling us the guardians that are doing dream missions that are staying at a house of a man named Eris and she had literally wrote, written this in her book. And she had met all of us separately, but didn't realize that we were all together. And her automatic writing says, where are the others, the intergalactic guardians, the auronauts, the start with Edis, he knows. And it's like, at that point, again, it's like, I can't make this stuff up. It's so crazy. And then, um, let's see. The, the next part that I'll share with you is just like another side note, like another confirmation. So when Abby and I danced on New Year's, I had this blue dress and this blue crystal crown on my head. But because of like the look of the show, I changed into my snake costume, my like gold snake costume. And I took my crown off and I went and danced. And fast forward a couple of weeks, I'm in San Marcos, I'm having breakfast. I meet this beautiful woman, Ilzen, and she's like this amazing goddess. And we start talking about our journey up to that point, and I'm like telling her that dance Deodova to Serpent's Egg, and she says, wait, I danced with Deodova to Serpent's Egg in Portland. I don't think I told you this part. And she's like, I just met Ashani, and she's like a total freaking sister. I'm pointing at Abby over here in <laughs> case you guys don't know. And so we're like, whoa, okay, we need to talk. Like, we need to, and, I'm t and I tell her the story about the, well and the womb and falling in the well and all of this stuff and at one point she's like i'm gonna tell you my story and she says at midnight at cosmic convergence she said that she felt very called to go off by herself and have a little medicine journey and she said that she kind of fell asleep she was not at my heart festival and she was not at to call with us but in her dream state on midnight she said she went to the top of the pyramids and she went up into the guardians of the galaxy she said she went up into this these blue light beings that were the guardians and she said that they sat her down and they gave her a blue crystal crown and they said you're a guardian now await your mission and i'm looking at her and i'm like i was on a mission my mission is complete <laughs> I took off the blue crystal crown, like I've seen the blue light beings, like tell me what you're going to do, what do you think your mission is? And she says, I don't know, but I need to go to Mexico. She said, everyone else is going to envision, but I need to go to Mexico and I want to go to the pyramids in Mexico. And I'm like, please, when you're there, will you pray to release the souls? We need to bring the light back. Will you please pray to release the souls? And she said, oh my God, did you just give me my mission? And I think that's when she told me the whole story about going to the Pyramid of Tikal and getting like ejected into the blue light beams. So again, it's like, I literally, I don't even know. I have no idea how to explain this other than to just like keep telling the story because it's all so tied together. Um, also, while I was in San Marcos, I started having dreams of the witches' caves. And in my dreams, they kept saying, go to the witches' caves, go to the witches' caves, go to the witches' caves. And I asked all these people about the witches' caves. No one knew what they were. And finally, I found this proprietor of a hotel where he um, had grown up in the area. But he's like a Westerner. And it's actually El Dragon Hotel where we're going to do our retreat the first week of January. And I'm so grateful to have met this man because I asked him about the witches' caves. And he said, oh, yeah, I've heard of those. They're above Panahachel. And... Um, so I'm like, okay, well, I have to go there. My dreams keep telling me to go to the witch's cave. And I had met an amazing woman, Pamela, at the festival. And we only met by, like, 
fist pumping at each other at the festival. We never really talked. We just was like, bah! and then one time on the street, we passed each other. And, we're like, ah. and then one day when I was staying in the pyramid house, I woke up and she was asleep on the couch. And then she played her cello. We had a beautiful morning. And I said, she said, she's from Panaha Chow. I said, have you heard of the witch's case? She said, yes, Cuevas de Brujas. I've heard of them, but I've never been there. I said, can you please take me there? And she said, yes, it's part of the way up to this place called Chichi if you want to go to this market. And I'm like, yes, I want to go. Let's go on Thursday. That's the day where the market is. So we make plans to go. And I wake up on Thursday, and it's the day of the flint blade or the obsidian knife in the Mayan calendar. And so I know I'm going to the Cuevas de Brujas, and I know I'm going to the market. I'm like, at the market, I'm going to get an obsidian blade. I'm going to get propal, I'm going to get candles. I'm going to get an obsidian blade. And um, we go, and we just have to ask, like, locals, like, Cuevas de Brujas, Cuevas de Brujas, Cuevas de Brujas. And this, this like, 90-year-old woman with these gold, like, pirate earrings says, she, like, takes us down a very <laughs> treacherous path on the side of a mountain. And I'll post pictures of all of this. And in the side of a mountain is just this, like, this womb space, this giant cave that apparently there have been fires burning in there for like 6,000 years. Like even through the Inquisition, the Mayans, when they couldn't openly do their ceremonies, they did them in this cave. And I'm pretty sure the fires go day and night, day and night, day and night, because Lawrence and Katja, who were with us, had been on the other side of the lake for like a week, and they've been watching this fire. They've been watching it like every night saying, like, what is that? And of course, they're the only two people that like came with us to Cuevas de Brujas. And actually, Katja had been to Chichi in the 80s and had seen the Civil War in Guatemala and had all these ties to this place as well. So we made a beautiful offering at Cuevas de Brujas. It was like thick with smoke and tears were streaming down my face. And it was like super intense. And then you go up to the top and it's Eagle Rock. And it's this place where supposedly Quetzalcoatl had recovered from a battle. And we're on there and it's over the lake. And it's like this most epic, beautiful, volcanic aquifer. And then that's just like one part of our day. We're like, okay, next part of the day, time to go to uh, Chichi to the market. And we go to Chichi and we go to the market. And I'm looking for, is the book of the, um, the Mayan cards anywhere? I'd love to have that. So we go under the, yeah, we go to Chichi and um, Pamela, she asks everybody, she's from there and she can speak Spanish, and she asks everybody for a flint knife or an obsidian blade. And we really didn't find any. There was some different ones that happened. Um, but the, really the first one that she gave me, she's like, this is your obsidian blade. And I'm like, I don't know, it's a little big. It's a little bit expensive and she's like Can't, this is it like figure it out you need to get this blade and so i got the obsidian blade and i've used it in ceremony a few different times and then once i was back in colorado i have the book the mayan oracle that my mom gave me before she passed that i think really kind of led me on this journey i mean there's poems in here about the blood running down the temple steps and um and i after i got back my cousin pulled the obsidian blade and shit look at that and what i didn't even realize is that i had gotten the exact replica of the blade that's in the book and then i i feel like i was literally on like a video game spiritual quest some kind of legend of zelda that i had like written for myself or that was written for me and so that was like one other piece to the story and um, it was like, the more, the more I tell the story, the more pieces keep clicking into place. Um, but I feel like there's some unfinished business. So one of the nights when I was there, I had, it was a day of women's wisdom and I had dinner with Katja on, on Rock and I was really feeling connected to her. And I was telling her my story, and that's when she shared with me about the Bufo being a big part of, like, the fall of the Mayan Empire. And I, she invited me on this retreat that she's doing to go to the Lunar Jaguar Hot Springs. And, of course, my heart starts racing because that's the place I didn't get to go. 
We did actually make it into the ruins of Copan, which lots of downloads there, but I felt like I needed more time to meditate because we were super fast. But we didn't even make it to the Lunar Jaguar Hot Springs, and that was like a huge reason that I was there. I mean, I'm like all about the moon. We had this Jaguar experience. A little side note is that I ended up making a Jaguar drum from a Jaguar that was found on Christmas on the day of our ceremony on the day of the Jaguar, on the first day of the new Mayan, that 13 day cycle. And so it's like, everything is just so linked up and so synced up, but I feel like there's this like one piece and maybe more, maybe once I get this one piece, I'll have another piece. Um, but I feel like I'm meant to go back. And so Omar has this retreat coming up on the from the 27th, of March through the 3rd, and I'm feeling very, very called to go there, and um, that's kind of was like the impetus for sharing this journey, um, is because, you know, I feel like there's more of you out there. There's the Safiras and the Ilsons and the Lindsays and the Abbeys and the Kims and the Amrocks, and it's like, there's a tribe of us, and Endon and Oso and Edis and like more people keep coming through. So I'm not here to like pitch, come on a retreat with me. <laughs> this is way more than this. I'm here to be like calling the spiritual warriors that know that you have work to do in this place with these people at this time. And like, let's go do it because there is more work to be done. And just when I was talking to Una, who's helping host this retreat through Bella Retreats, I was telling her my story and she's like, you have to make a video of this. You have to share it. I'm like, it's kind of long. She's like, that's okay. <laughs> it's filled with information. And I'm telling her about the, the star frog medicine. And she said, oh my God, Kim, you're not going to believe it. There's an unexcavated archeological site at the hotel that we're staying at. And it's, it's like not a tourist place. Um, and they think it's a place of births, but I'm curious as to why they think that because I think, places tend to be different than what people originally perceive, but it's a place on the grounds of where we're staying. And it's a place where there's these giant rock carvings of all these toads. And I had no idea that that was there when I first heard about this retreat and when I first wanted to go there, but I feel like there's like downloads of information to get from that land, from Amrok, from the people. I'm like fully open to continuing the journey. If like more things call me, if I had like another crazy dream to go to a different place and I've learned don't buy a return flight unless you have to. <laughs> um, but I don't know the ending to the story yet. I don't know how I'm going to tie it up in a tidy little bow, but I do know that um, I've been on like an epic spiritual quest and there's epic spiritual people that are coming into the field and that we're all working together to like, I almost want to say right or wrong, but I don't know if that's correct, but we're coming together to like put things back on track is what I feel like. And this is where we, we have the fire ceremonies to pray for the future. This is where we take our role as the ancestors of the future. This is where we, honor those who have sacrificed themselves and where we release the best and the brightest and the most beautiful and the most sexual and the most sensual and all of the people that have been persecuted or sacrificed. And I even met an amazing woman that's from the Yucatan Peninsula that's been doing a lot of the same work as me. Anna, I love you. And she, she did the same work at the Arlington Cemetery. She had this giant smoky quartz that told her to fly to Washington, D.C. on this certain day and go there. She didn't even know it was Veterans Day until she got there, and there was too many crowds. So she ended up going to this one little section to do a ceremony with the smoky quartz. She didn't know what she was doing, and she was in where all the women soldiers were buried. And she literally was, and she said the swirling energy, and she was, like, freeing the women who had sacrificed themselves for the country. So, like, whether you're coming to Guatemala with me or not, if you find yourself in a place where like sacrifice was happening, like we all have the power to make right the wrongs, to actually pray for things to be right, to like release any light that has been trapped. 
and to really like make a difference in this like spiritual warrior mode like we're no longer in like a spiritual war but we're in this like recovery period and like carlos said you know the light and the dark have always been balanced on this earth but for a long time the light has been hidden had been sacrificed and so I'll, I'll end on this beautiful final magical moment and then I know Drew was interested in some questions but this has been super long so I don't know if anyone's still there but um, when I got back so I got back and then on the very next day my partner Chachi and I hosted a um, cacao and kava ceremony at Archipelago with sound healing and meditation and we do those every month in different places and one of my longtime students and friends Sarah, Hi, Sarah she came up to me and just gave me a great big hug and she leaned back and she said <sighs> she's totally so, so excited by the way <laughs> she said <gasps> what happened to your womb and I said holy shit you have no idea and she said it feels so expansive like dropping a rock into a well and it just keeps going and going and going and my heart still like races when I hear that because it's like every time I start to be like this can't be real like one more thing comes to like be like this is freaking real and so I'll leave you with that and I'm, I have no idea what's going to happen now this has been like one of the scariest things I've ever done sharing a story that's this like maybe intense or controversial or certainly long or you know spiritual and um medicinal and everything else but i wanted to share this story with people because i know that all of us have our missions and sometimes um, our paths are sometimes we don't know what's happening but we know something that's bigger than us is happening and i want every single person who feels that way to like follow that path and I want to call in the people that are on this journey with me and that are on this um, mission with me so that we can complete the mission and uh, get back to living a good way, which is probably more missions and more travel and more awesomeness. So, um, I'll ask you guys that are here if you have any questions or maybe we'll just close it up. We can do questions online. <clears throat> What was the uh, impression that you had that was from the wind? The wind. I don't remember anything about the wind. You were asking the wind to take away the spirit. Oh, it's a loom? Yeah, so that was just like, it was the weirdest sensation ever of having something feel like something filled my womb. And like, I had just meditated on like walking my masculine into the womb. And I'm aware of like the law of the universe that like, when you create space, something fills it. And so I was like, oh my God, I just took something on. I just like released an energy. And in that moment, I just, I asked the wind to take it away. Cause I was like, that's not me. It's not mine, take it away. And I've done that before. If someone like says a nasty thing to me, I'll like walk outside and be like, wind, take it away. And they just like freeze it. So I was trying that technique, but, um, you know, I carried that with me until Christmas Eve um, when we had our ceremony and when I was like, had this being embody my body. And that's when it actually was released. Yeah. Do you have any questions or comments, Abby? Because Abby was there. Oh my gosh. Um, I don't have any questions or comments about the story, but I have yet another message of confirmation for you that happened to me today right before this. Oh my God. Um, at yoga with Alyssa, Philosophy Tuesday, um, the, her message today was about your soul, you chose this lifetime, your soul chose this lifetime to do this work, and you have a destiny that you must complete, and if anybody else could do it, they would be doing it for you, but they can't, so you're yeah. here, and... Um, you have purpose, and we all have, have this purpose as gift of this lifetime. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. yeah. Thank you, Abby.
I mean, we all have a spiritual mission to complete. <laughs> I love that. Anybody else? I'm sure there might be questions from people online, but I maybe will answer them later unless Chachi can read some to me. Um, Marjorie is saying that you look so peaceful and beautiful. She's so proud of you. <laughs> Jennifer Ricker, this is just what I need tonight. So in tune, so impactful, love and appreciation. Mm -hmm. We can open it up for more questions again. I don't know. Yeah, if anybody has any questions, um, you know, my main mission of sharing this was to just like get it out and get it documented because it's the kind of thing where like little details can get lost over time, um, but also to call in the people that need to come to Honduras and Guatemala with me. And a big part of this trip to Honduras, it's the healing path of the ancient Maya with Amrak, this amazing elder. It's um, March 27th through April 3rd. And a big part of this, from what I understand, is actually praying for Honduras. So we're staying in an area of Honduras that is um, very close to the border of Guatemala. It's near Copan, which are these beautiful ancient ruins. And it's very safe. Like, I know Honduras has, like, not the best reputation right now. But I went there. It's touristy. I bought these amazing feathered bluebird feathered earrings in Copan. The tour bus almost left me there because I had to stay and buy them. Um, but it's very safe. It's, like, touristy. And, um, and it's very sacred. That being said, Honduras is in a time of transition. And in a time of... Um, you know, really needing some help. And so if that's a part of the journey, not just to pray for like the freeing of individual souls and big groups of people and liberation for the earth and freedom from corrupt governments and like help for Honduras, you know, like this is, this is what we can all do. We can all do this everywhere we go. We can pray. And that word prayer is loaded but just like unload it and let it be your way of wishing the best for the world. Marjorie says she's in tears. She's so happy that you had that experience on so many levels. That's your sister. I know, yeah. That's so sweet. I love you, Marjorie. Thank you so much. And Jennifer. <laughs> Jennifer's been on some awesome spiritual retreats with me with where other amazing spiritual things have happened. So maybe we'll make a video about that on over. <laughs> so Kim, would you say that the freeing of souls is your like mission purpose, or do you think that this is there's another um, evolution that mm. that you don't know yet, or that you do know yet, and that this is the step towards something? I was like, what is your mission here? So according to the Mayan calendar, um, I am a dog, um, which is the dog is the one that, that carries the humans through the underworld, you know? And another part of my Mayan astrology is the vulture or the condor, which is like the bone cruncher. And I've actually been like brought... Um, I've had a hawk die in my arms and two great horned owls brought to me to be processed and have their wings cut. I mean, that's like a whole nother spiritual story, but two great horned owls were brought to me on the two full moons on the 1st and 31st of January last year by two different women named Jane, you know, like, I think my <laughs> spiritual mission is to be on a spiritual mission and tell people about it. <laughs> um, but I think freeing the souls is a big part of it. And maybe that's why I do the one-on-one -on -one healing work where I help people come into their freedom. Um, but I have been feeling that like a, a new part of my spiritual mission, especially with like um, my womb space and clearing my womb is like, and not in, not super soon, but I am feeling like a big part of my spiritual mission is to bring a new soul or new souls into the world and and actually have children i never felt that way before i felt like i'm a warrior i'm here to do this work i gotta keep going i keep warrioring but like now that i feel like my mission is complete i feel like i'm retired um i feel like now i can like think about having a family and um on the blood moon of last year so i was in guatemala for the blood moon this year but on the blood moon of last year 
I actually had a man, um, Mateo, hi. he asked me um, to do a voiceover for this performance piece, and I didn't know what it was, but in the voiceover, I actually um, got to talk about him, and so I didn't know what it was, but I'm reading it, and I'm like, if you want to know about Mateo, he was a spiritual warrior, like, fighting to free the souls, but he recently retired, and... And I, and I asked him, and he said he was fighting in his dreams. He was doing the work in his dreams. And I literally have been battling in my dreams for eight years, like battling hardcore, actually. And on help me free me in my dreams. But like the or not the dream, I never heard that word before, but like that's a real thing that some people do. And when this man like told me about that and he said he was retired, I was like, how do I get retired? And he was like, you have to complete your mission. And I was like, what is my mission? So in a lot of ways, I feel like mission complete, mm -hmm. for sure. Although not quite, because I have to go back to Lunar Jaguar Hot Springs. And I wish I could remember how to say toads in Spanish, because it's called Los something, and I can't remember right now, but I'm sure Alexis will tell me later. So I answer your question? Yeah. As much as you, yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Well, I think I'm going to call it a night. Thanks, Kimmy. Mm -hmm. Very long yeah. story. Altiel! We're going to cheers to Kakao and to the Mayans and to the mission that we all have. Oh, we're clicking. We, Shuni taught us you don't have to click your glasses when you're in the Mayan tradition because we're not testing each other to see if there's poison. We're just in deep gratitude as we go counterclockwise and say Maltiel, which Maltiel. is gratitude and just... Remembering the Mayans, that the the way that they make an offering to the world and the way that they like provide this honey to the gods is through beauty and gratitude.